What is up, everybody? What is up? Welcome back to the Science of Flipping podcast. I am your host, Justin Colby. And if you're watching this on YouTube, you can see I have an incredible guest. A lot of you know who this gentleman is. Um, but before I get to introduce someone who I'm completely honored to have on the Science of Flipping podcast, uh, if this happens to be the first time you've seen me, heard me um, on the Science of Flipping This podcast is all about creating systems, strategies, implementation, tools to become an incredible real estate investor, build the life that you want to build, um, and create the business that you want to create. So uh, if you have any questions, go to thescienceofflipping.com. I have a book on Amazon called The Science of Flipping that I sell every day for $15, but for the listeners, I give it away for free. It's my actual book. Uh, so just go to the scienceflipping.com, download the book for free, just more system and, and tools for you guys to be successful in the game. Anything and everything you want as far as more education, possible coaching or mastermind programs is on the scienceofflipping.com. So go there, you can see old podcasts, all that good stuff. So um, I wanted to do that really quickly because I'm very excited to have my guest on this show. Uh, he is the 100 Mile Man. Uh, but his true name is Jesse Itzler, uh, founder of Marquee Jets, uh, part owner in Atlanta Hawks, founder of Zico Water. I mean, this guy is dynamic. So, my brother, what is up, man? What's going on with you? How you doing, Jesse? Thanks for having me, man. Dude, I couldn't be more honored uh, to have you on the, the podcast, the show. Uh, I am so grateful for you to spend a, a couple minutes with us here at the Science Flipping, dude. Awesome. When it's all over, I want to replace some of the pictures on the back behind you. Oh, really? What, what would you replace these pictures with? I'd probably put Dominique up there or some hawks or some, you know, something. Uh, yeah. I'll keep it red, but I'll, I'll keep it red in the south. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a, uh, so I'm like a lightweight collector. So everything I collect is typically signed, right? So I got my Bo Jackson, my Jordan, uh, Jerry Rice. I have Willie Mays down here. Um, so I'm not a big collector, but Hey, if you happen to know somebody that might've played for the Hawks and you want to, you want to send a little gift my way for Christmas, listen, dude, I'm not going to say no. You know what I mean? I'm not going to say no. It's, it's, it's amazing. I'll tell you, I'm not a big collector of memorabilia, although, you know, I appreciate it. But when my wife, when I was dating my, my wife, when we were just boyfriend and girlfriend, she came to my house and I had some memorabilia. So of some basketball stuff. So she framed her underwear and signed it and put it on the wall. Shut up. Yeah, which is I, hilarious. I so fucking love next it. To like <laughs> Dr. J, I have like Dr. J, you know, Muhammad Ali gloves, Dr. J jersey, and my wife's underwear. I, I hope it's still there today just to make sure everyone remembers. Of course. I love it. Of course. Well, and you bring up your wife and, and, I mean, talk about a dynamic duo. You guys are a power couple, right? Your wife is – owner and founder of a small company, not really a very big company, but Spanx, um, which she in and of herself has created a freaking empire there, right? I even think you have a shirt on if, if you show it uh, of Spanx. Yeah, promote it. Uh, it's just <laughs> a small little billion dollar a year company, no big deal, right? So uh, you guys are awesome and completely dynamic. And again, I'm just so grateful that you're spending some time here. I actually... We have a lot of mutual friends, right? Brad is, is a good friend of mine, and uh, I know you and he have a very close relationship. He actually called me because you had, what, three weeks ago? You had some people over at the house up in Connecticut, and he's like, dude, get your ass here. And I was like, oh, man, we got our mastermind that same exact weekend. But I guess that event, I don't know if you would even call it an event, but for that close-knit group, I heard that was off the chain. It was amazing. We, you know, I've been to so many different uh, masterminds and speaking events and seminars, and very often uh, they're at hotels or they're very similar. And I just wanted to create something totally different, so I, I decided to do it at my home. Yeah. And I had forty five people come for the weekend with, and I brought in six amazing speakers, and it was a great, it was a really cool format because in the morning. We had, we had a great workout, 6 a.m. to 7 a.m. I made everybody take a cold plunge. It was optional but highly encouraged. Uh, and then we started this amazing, basically from 8 in the morning till 1 lectures. But then in the afternoon, there were electives. I had a water ski instructor. 
I had a paddleboard coach, a yoga instructor. So it's kind of like adult camp. Yeah. And uh, you'll come to the next one. Yeah, that'll. Uh, I think you're having another one in Atlanta coming soon, aren't you? Or something similar. Yeah. I think this one's a little yeah, more yeah. fitness, mind, body, and fitness oriented. Yeah, I just, you know what? Honestly, I've realized that I, for me, the days of going on vacations and sitting on the beach in Mexico, while I love to do that and I love to relax, if I'm going to take a couple of days or a weekend a week, I really want to get motivated or inspired or get a nugget or a takeaway that I can apply to my life. Yep. And so I figured if I could create that for other people, great. But that's also what I'm looking for. You know, I want to, I'm, I want to invest in me. Yeah. I want to invest in events and things that make me better all the time. And that could be a 5K race or that could be a, a personal coach or that could be a retreat with other like-minded people. But, you know, I really – I got a limited time left on earth, man. I want to make sure I, I get the most out of it. And to me, that's – you know, that's not necessarily laying in sand. Yeah, that's – um. I mean you and, and our mutual friend Kent Clothe, you're my business partner. I mean you guys really both hit heavily on this. The time is now. You have a limited amount of time. Average age of a male is 78. If you do the math backwards, you know, we only have so many hours and days left. And, uh, you know, when we all kind of met at the Scale and Escape event where you are our keynote speaker, um, I mean, you just impressed everyone, dude. Kudos to you. I mean, literally everyone in that room was like, Jesse Itzler is the man. And, you know, the way you deliver, yeah. how you deliver, and why I wanted you on this podcast, dude, is – you know, we get roughly 10,000 downloads a week on the podcast and people need to hear your message, right? Um, and so it, it's so true, right? Why do tomorrow what you could do today? You only have so much time left. And what you did with me, you put me through an exercise, like literally right as we met. You sat me down, right? If you remember, we were back in the green room and you're like, Justin, Colby, listen, on a scale of one to 10, throw yeah. everything into a bucket. What are the things, what are the tens? Like, how happy are you really? <laughs> and you, I'm well, sitting no, there and, go ahead. It's a, great, it's, a, it's a great test. I call it, it's the happiness meter. And it, what's amazing about it is it only takes five seconds and you get a lot of clarity around what areas you have to work on. And if you remember, what I said to you is I said, take all the buckets in your life, your weight, your finances, your relationships, you know, your everything your spirit, just how you feel, throw them into one blender, shake it up, and on a scale of one to 10, with 10 being the Dalai Lama of happiness and one being you know, rock bottom, where, where are you? And I asked you to think about it and you gave me a number. And um, most pe for most people, when they do that, they say, you know, wow, I'm, I'm really happy, I'm a, I'm a seven. And I say, well, that's great, but if your son comes home from school with a 70, on a test, that's a C in the most important bucket of your life, you know? So if you're a seven or below, if you're a six and a half, you're basically failing, it, you know, if you're, you're a D, um, well, what happens is the way your brain operates is the immediately you think when you're posed with that question, you think of immediately your brain subtracts from a 10, the two or three things that you are most unhappiest with. It's just instantly like, oh man, I just, I wish I had more money or oh, my relationship sucks with my wife or whatever it is, and that's why I'm an eight. So I just said to you, you know, well, whatever the first two things, you don't even have to tell me, popped into your head, that's what you have to work on. And if you're not working on that, you're nuts. Like if you're going through life satisfied that you're a seven or an eight, and you're not working on the two things that got you from an eight, you know, took away from a 10 to an eight, if you're not investing in making those better, what are you doing? Yeah. You know? So, yeah, I mean, it's, it really works for me. It's a great way to take inventory of where you, are, where you are in your life. I think that's a monthly, you know, weekly, monthly. I mean, it just hit home to me, right? Because I would say most people look at me and I feel like I'm incredibly happy internally. Like, I'm a happy guy, right? I'm smiling. I'm gregarious. There's not a lot that weighs me down, right? Um, I kind of have a shoulder shrug mentality. Shit goes wrong. Oh, well, on to the next thing. Not a big deal. I don't let it weigh on me. Um, but when you and I went through that, even though I truly internally feel like I'm really happy, there's things that aren't tens in my life. And so when you made me throw it into a blender, it took it, that assessment of saying, oh, man, I'm not acing life right now, right? I have things I can work on. I have things I can get better. And it's a power for the listeners. If you just do that, right? 
do exactly what Jesse said. It's so powerful to realize where you really are in life um, with your internal happiness. And there should be nothing less. Jesse hit it on the head when he did it with me. He was like, I don't accept less than 10. I'll take a nine, nine and a half. But if it's not a nine, nine and a half or 10, you don't do it, right? I mean, you have plenty of opportunities. People are pulling you a lot of different directions. You're uber, uber successful in business. And as I get to know you personally in life, right? Your marriage, you're an incredible father to your children. Um, but if something's not a 10, you're not even doing it. Yeah, or I'm working, you know, look, a lot of stuff is out of your control. And, you know, life deals with everybody different circumstances. And, but um, a lot of it is attitude. A lot of it is, you know, how are you, what are you doing to make yourself proud? I mean, for example, my, my parents are aging. You know, my dad's in his late 80s. And I've, I've, I'm a big believer in that you have to do things that make you proud of yourself. And you get opportunities that present itself where you can either, you make a decision. You know, do I want to go uh, on vacation with my friends or do I want to go take care of my dad, you know, or my mom? And when you make the right decision, you feel good. Your happiness goes up. You feel fulfilled. You feel proud of yourself. And, you know, so we get these decisions and circumstances. It's just how we, how we approach them and how we deal with them. So, yeah, I wouldn't say I'm a 10, but I'm, I'm a work in progress. But I rec identify what needs work, you know, and, and try my best to doesn't always work, but try my best to, to improve in those areas. No doubt. I think that's the, the key for me always. And we have a, another mutual friend, Pat Precourt, and I know he was at your house. Um, him and I talk about this all the time, right? 1% better every day, right? And at the end of three months, you're almost 100% better as a person. So to me, it's always about progress. I don't have to change the world. I don't have to go from, you know, zero to 10. I can, I can make progress along the way, right? And make those decisions, which ultimately fulfill me and where I'm at to be to that level 10 in business personally and otherwise. Right. So, yeah, I mean, I would challenge the 1% every day. I've heard that before and I like it. Of course you want to improve, but I think, I mean, I, I flip that around a little bit and for me, it's just 110% effort all the time. Every day. And I think it, it's, yeah, like I might not, I might be able to run a mile in nine minutes today and Tomorrow, I might run it in 9.05, so I didn't get 1% better. But maybe that day I was tired, on bad legs, it was raining or whatever. But as long as I'm giving that effort and the mentality and the mindset of, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go through this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it as best I can, that to me is the most important thing. And it's not, it's all the little things. Yeah. It's all the little things that – you got, you know, you know my quote, Justin, how you do it, that I love, how you do anything is how you do everything. Yep. How you do anything is how you do everything. So it's the little things. It's the, you know, uh, my faucet's running, dripping. I'll fix it tomorrow. No. Let me go get the wrench and try to fix it now because I don't want to, that's, that's an indication of what I'm becoming. I don't want to become lazy. I don't want to become the guy that says, I'll just do it tomorrow. So it's those little things that, that, you know, in business, in real estate, making the extra calls you know, returning all the emails, um, going to the appointments that might not close, staying at the restaurant so you're the last person there so you, you know, you meet someone. You know, people always said to me, like, so many times in my life, people have been like, you got, oh my God, it's so lucky you bumped into so-and-so. And I'm like, I created that luck. Yeah. I took the trip to San Francisco to be in the room to meet the person that I didn't know was there yet. You know, I put myself, it's like, I call it weight versus create, you know, create versus weight. You can create your own luck or you can wait for it. And when you wait for your own luck to happen, it, nev it never happens. When you create your own luck, when you put yourself in this situation, which means being vulnerable very often, when you get comfortable with that vulnerability, that's where any of the magic happens. I'm sure the people that ace real estate you know, are the people that, that do the little things and are the people that aren't scared to put themselves out there. Yeah, it's, it's funny you bring that up. Um... One of the biggest challenges personally, so I run, and you know, you know enough that we speak on stage together and these things, and so I run a lot of meetup groups and a lot of events, and one of the biggest things that every morning, one, part of my ritual is to be able to take on that vulnerability of, and you can use another word, fear or uh, anxiety, to say, oh boy, here we go. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't want to be judged. I don't want people to think and be able to recognize it for me 
and I recognize it, and then I hit it head on, right? So in the morning, I give thanks. I do my entire ritual. But then for me, um, being in the public eye, and you're more so in the public eye than I am, the things we do are watched, scrutinized, judged constantly. Um, and so I'm just kind of relating it into a place of I'm able to, and, and I would hope everyone can get to a place of take on that vulnerability and um, appreciate it to a certain level, right? Because to your point, Jesse, that of uh, being able to appreciate the vulnerability and attack it puts you in the right room at the right time to say, I don't care what they think, that they don't know my name. I'm going to go up to CEO so-and-so and introduce myself, right? And say, hey, nice to meet you. My name is Justin. I'd look forward to, you know, maybe giving two or three minutes with you to talk a little bit of X, Y, and Z, right? Um, I have yeah, to I mean, work on that myself is, is the point I'm bringing up is that's a daily routine for me to be vulnerable, to put myself out there, to be able to say, I don't care if I look like an idiot on this Instagram photo or video, like I'm doing it because my intentions are bigger and my purpose is bigger than my fear of being vulnerable. Yeah, I think a lot of people are scared about, I mean, it's just human nature. You want to be liked, you don't want to be embarrassed. And people are concerned about what other people will say or think or talk behind their back about or whatever. But for me, a good exercise is I just recognize I'm very aware of the fact that in 100 years, no one in my life, no one around me is going to even be on this planet. Right. And, you know, as big as Steve Jobs or the Queen of England or um, George Washington, whoever, think of people that have really impacted and changed the world. Do you wake up and think about Steve Jobs? Sure don't. No. No. I mean, my grandmother lived a life. She lived in her 90s. I'm sure 60 years ago, she woke up with pressures of bills and pressures of relationships and whether or not she was going to go on a date or get married or whatever she was worrying about. And that life is over. Her, her, all those fears and worries that she accumulated, it's, she's, she's no longer alive. Right. No one in our world is going to be alive in 100, 150 years from now. Do you think I care if someone says no when I ask them for an appointment or they laugh at me because I didn't finish a marathon? Or they say, you know, oh, wow, we started this business and it wasn't successful. Like, if I'm going to let that, like, who cares? We're insignificant. So when you put it in perspective and you go through life with this, like, I don't want to say, you know, um, we, with the consequences, and I'm not talking about doing things illegal or anything like that, but the consequences of risk, um, you're not, you know, aren't impacted by what other people think. Yeah. Then you go and do whatever the fuck you want to do. No doubt. And that's sort of how, why I do it. I mean, I've had races uh, that I haven't finished. I've had, you know, marathons that I haven't finished. And, you know, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to not do it because there's a chance that I might not succeed. Right. You know, the, like my wife always says, she's redefined failure as not trying and not the consequence or the outcome. outcome. And I feel like I've been living that for a long time. So, um, you know, you got to find the tools that work for you. And for me, it, you know, it might not, I don't know if that resonates at all with you, but for me, it's not, that's what I think. I'm like, you know what? This guy's not even going to, no one in Italy even knows I, I'm alive. Right. What, it's a huge world. There's 7 billion people with their own problems. Everyone in their own bubble. Let me go live my life and not be concerned about, about a, any other thoughts. So, um, and yeah. no one really gives a shit about our lives anyways. No one Maybe could... for one second, but no, they got their own, they're off worrying about their own laundry list of problems or issues or challenges. There's yeah. no doubt. There's no doubt. So I want to, I want to bring into this message was so powerful when you kind of spoke about this, but I want to bring in your past. I want people to know a little bit more about you. There's a lot of my listeners who already know about you as, you know, obviously, you know, I've talked about you at, at length, but Talk a little bit about that beginning of business, right? Because you've not only started billion dollar companies like Marquis Jets and Zico Water and Atlanta Hawks owner, and you've done some incredible things. But what we're talking about, which I think is so valuable for my listeners or any entrepreneurs out there, is this allowing yourself to be vulnerable, to not give a shit and go for it. And I know your past story about uh, you know, your record, you know, music industry and how you kind of just said, yep, that's who I am. All right. I have my lawyer, which is your dad. And, and we go into the book, but 
talk a little bit about your beginnings and some of those risks that you kind of take to say, shit, okay, I want to go get that meeting, so I'm going to cold call them every day, or I'm going to sit in that restaurant till it closes to, in hopes I meet that. Give a little background about your starting point, because there's a lot of people out there that are just terrified of starting. What if I fail? What if it doesn't work? What if, what if I don't make any money? What if, what if, what if, right? And they well, don't yeah. go. Right. So for me, I had to, I had to go all the way back to probably when I was a teen, even before I was a teenager, my parents gave me a long leash, um, encouraged me to try a variety of things and encouraged me to, you know, whether or not I was successful or not, they were just proud that I tried them. But I remember when I was 15 years old, I was, I lived in New York, grew up in Long Island. I lived in New York and, um, in the eight, in the early eighties, hip hop and, and all music and break dancing and all that stuff was like, that's what people were doing, you know, at least where I was growing, where I grew up. And so I decided uh, when I was 15 that I was, I was into break dancing. I know that sounds crazy. I don't look the part, but I was. And I went, I decided that I was gonna go with my, my friend Myron Freeland, um, white guy and black guy to Washington DC because we figured there's no way the kids in DC were as good as the kids in, in New York, just impossible. So I convinced my sister who just got her license to drive us to Washington DC. I think I told my mom I was going to the dentist or something. My sister was taking me for a long dentist appointment. So we got in the car and we drove five hours and the whole time there I'm thinking to myself, terrible idea. What if no one shows up? What if we get booed? What if we get beaten up? What if the kids are better than us? So we set up in, in Georgetown at this little um, bank parking lot. We had our boom box. We put our boom box down and tilted our hat. <laughs> I love it. But, you know, we got out there and um, the music starts going and we start doing our thing. And then, you know, one person comes, two people come, you know, next thing you know, there's a little crowd and we take our hat off when we're done. We pass our hat around and people are putting money in the hat. Four or five hours later, you know, the hats fold up and we we count up our money and we have like $280 and I paid my sister for the gas, $60. And I paid her for food and that, me and Myron, we went and we got something to eat and then we had, we split up the money and we had $48 each. And I remember Myron look, counting his money and looking me dead in the eyes and said, Jess, we're fucking rich. <laughs> and the, but, but what I didn't realize at the time was that was the classic lesson in vulnerability. So I'm 15, the whole car ride up, I'm thinking about all the nerves, the butterflies, all the things that can go wrong. Nothing of what could go right. right. All the things that could go wrong. Then I go out there, I you know, flick the monkey off my shoulder that's telling me everything's gonna suck. I get out there in front of this crowd and then there's a reward. I'm like, whoa, you take a risk and you make yourself vulnerable and you can get rewarded? That felt really good. And it was like an adrenaline rush. And then I was like, even now, all the time I get on stage, it's, I had the same shoulder monkey, same butterflies and nerves, same, what if they don't like me? What if I get booed? What if they don't laugh at the jokes? Whoa, that was super rewarding at the end. It's, it never goes away. Right. It's the same thing. But once you, once you understand that you're not scared of that and you, you're, you're comfortable in that, in that space, amazing things happen. You have an author, you have a book out, you're on Amazon, you said in the beginning of the podcast. Yeah. That's insane vulnerability. You're gonna get comments, Justin, this sucks. Right. Justin, I didn't learn anything. Justin, you're not really happy, you, you're fake happy. Justin, you're a jerk, whatever. You're out there, you're exposed, but you took that risk because you wanted the reward of helping people, maybe making money off it, maybe whatever, having it as a calling card, but that's full blast exposure. Totally. You were willing to do that, right? And I'm yeah. sure it's been super rewarding. You're yeah. talking about it, giving it away for free. You're proud of it. Yeah. So, you know, all I'm saying is as an entrepreneur, it started early for me and that was my first taste of it. And from there, it was just, it was just, it just, that adrenaline of risk was a rocket ship. Yeah. And I didn't care about the consequences, especially when I was young. I cared about the results. So it, it was never, there was never a B plan. There was never, you know, I baked, I baked the, um, the dream into my DNA. 
So when I was going after a record deal, I baked that dream into my DNA until, and then I worked. That was the end of the movie. I'm going to have a record deal. And then I just filled in the script along the way, whatever it took. Now for me, it took bullshitting my way into an office. They thought I was some, I set up a meeting at the record label that signed me. They thought I was a guy named Dana Dane. They thought that I set up a meeting as Dana Dane, uh, who was an African American uh, rapper from Brooklyn with gold teeth. Definitely not <laughs> seeming like me. And I called up the record label because I, I read that the owner was a fan of Dana's. And he, the secretary thought I was Dana and said, you know, Mike, the owner would love to meet you, Dana, come in. So I went in as Dana and played my demo while we waited, quote unquote, for Dana and got a record deal. And um, so risk, creative, thinking on your feet, um, whatever it takes attitude within, you know, uh, within the guidelines of, of the law. Um, <laughs> yeah, of, of not just the law, but of, of print, you know, like, Good principles. Morality. Uh, yeah. Is sort of what what's happened. And, and, you know, the other thing I would say, Justin, is that, I, you know, I have no business background. I never took a business class. I never took an accounting business class. Um, I took a public speaking class. I took an advertising class. And I really gravitated toward those two things. Uh, but that, to me, was a big blessing because it guaranteed that everything I did in my life would, would be diff, done differently and not by the book. Like have a business plan and do it this way and then go to this person. I like, I ripped that, that blue, that blueprint never crossed my desk. Right. So it was all on instinct. And you know, if I was the other person, how could I get them on? What would I want to hear to get them on the phone? What email do I have to send to get them to react? What do I have to say about this property that will emotionally connect the potential buyer to make them interested in buying it. Yep. What are they into? What, what is it that I can say that this property has that will emotionally feel like they need to own it, that the universe is calling them to own this? And that's not manipulating. That's just tapping into what the customer wants and and really articulating it in a way that they understand in a short amount of time. Yeah. No, it's a, I couldn't agree more. And I think one of the levels of sometimes for me and and maybe for yourself, if you find this, but it's hard to help someone tap into the shoulder shrug mentality that I don't give a fuck. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to go do it. And I don't care about the result, right? I don't care about if someone says no, because no means I can just go and I'll get the end result. Um, It takes a little something. The entrepreneurs that go there, it takes a little, whether we have a little screw loose, whether we just simply don't give a fuck, whatever that is, that's what I want. You have such a way of being able to communicate that message to you got a record deal, right? You're, uh, uh, you got a record deal, not just as a musician, but as a rapper, right? Back in the nineties where that whole industry was just beginning to blow up and was predominantly African American, right? I mean, there was basically vanilla ice, Marky Mark, and maybe that was it. And you, right? I mean, there was, I mean, maybe boys, a couple yeah. others around. I mean, Beastie yeah. Boys obviously were there, well, right? But th- that's what it takes. I think it's the I think it's the the power of persuasion, and I think that you know being able to persuade is a, is an art. And the first person you have to persuade is yourself. You have to believe that you belong there. And once you believe you belong in the race, or you belong at the table, or you belong in the room everything's different when you're playing scared and trying to convince people you belong or you're not really sure you belong. It's really hard to close. Yeah. Part of that is just being an expert. You know, you have to know, you have to know the property you're selling to sell it in real estate. You have to know the comps, you have to know all this stuff. And, um, if you don't, you're at a huge disadvantage. If you do, and you, you've gained the trust, uh, of an, of being an expert, to the person you're dealing with, it's a lot easier. So, um, and as you get older and you have more experience, uh, that becomes easier, right? Cause you got more things under your belt and you're just more comfortable talking about it. Yeah. But I've always, yeah, you know, that, that, that second marathon is way easier than the first. There's no doubt. Well, let's talk about something that to your point, you didn't have this business background, but you freaking started marquee jets, right? Um, what an incredible company. What an incredible idea. 
and ultimately ended up selling it off to Warren Buffett's company, but NetJets. But let's talk about that. How do you even get in the door? You were young, weren't you? In your young twenties, mid mid twenties, when that whole concept started with you and your partner. Yeah, I was in my late twenties. Uh, well, we got in. The, we were good at getting in the door, but we were also good get good at getting thrown out of the door because the first <laughs> lasted about ten minutes. Yeah. Uh, before they said, if you think we're giving our air our eight hundred airplanes to you two guys to use your, it's not happening. Yeah. Never. There's, never was like the exact word, and. Um, when we left, we left them. We had set up a meeting to pitch this idea of a 25-hour jet card. The, the theory was that people would want to have all the benefits of owning their own airplane. It would be available anywhere on eight-hour notice you, um, with none of the responsibilities of ownership. You don't have to worry about the pilots or the scheduling or the maintenance. All that would be taken care of. You just call up. I want my plane to take me from Atlanta to New York at 6 o'clock tonight. Mr. Ritzler will be there. Um, the problem is we had no airplanes, so we went to, net, we went to NetJets. Crazy yeah. slight problem. We went to a company called NetJets that owned six or 700 airplanes at the time. They were owned by Berkshire Hathaway, Warren Buffett's company. And we pitched this idea for a 25-hour flight card where you would prepay for the time and just work off the time like a debit card. And that, like I said, that meeting lasted 10 minutes. But what happened was the owner of the company came, uh, the president of the company came out after the meeting and said, guys, that was unbelievable. And we said, well, we got thrown out of the room. He said, no, no one, no one gets 10 minutes with Rich Santulli, the CEO. Right. It, it was something here. He said, but you got to, I want you to repitch it, repitch it, bring it to life. So we did. And we realized that, you know, he probably gets pitched in the same way, power via PowerPoint, all week, every day of every of every week. So we decided just to do it differently and bring in our own focus group. We said, look, if we want to sell this, let's have potential customers stand up and just talk about why this program would resonate and work. And we left with a deal. And a year later, we were uh, doing more in sales than NetJets. We did five billion dollars in cumulative sales uh, over the course of our run. And uh, and then we sold it to to NetJets. Um, that's, I mean, that's yeah. awesome. How do you even get into the door there? How did you get into uh, Rich Santulli's door in the, in the first place? You and your buddy had this idea. By the way, the idea is brilliant to this day, right? This is all about Airbnb. And, I mean, it's the idea, right? Yeah. You have all the same benefits without the ownership of the idea. But yeah. how do you get into Rich Santulli's door? How does that even start? Well, it starts by, it's in this particular case, it, it was uh, it came through an indirect relationship. So I had a friend that, that knew someone at NetJets, my friend Steve Rifkin, who started a company called Loud Records, made an introduction uh, to uh, Jim Jacobs, who was the president of the company. But it comes with a very short elevator pitch and a what's in it for them. So. It's very important when you set up meetings that the that that because um, I get pitched all the time, but it's it's very often it's a one way pitch. Yep. Need your help doing this. Da, da, da. It's very very important that there's mutual benefits. So we had a good elevator pitch, and even today, Justin, I would say that you know we both get. I'm sure many of the listeners here get bombarded as well with emails, sure. and it amazes me at how poor at, at how people don't know how to craft an email yeah. to get what they want. Like there is, email is an art form and it starts with the subject header and capturing people immediately in the subject header. If, I, if you don't get me or if you, you can lose me before I even open the email, if it's not a, a real headline. Yep. So you have to have a headline that makes me want to open it. And then when I open it, I want it to be super short. I want you to sell me like immediately. So you know, now I'm getting paragraphs and paragraphs and paragraphs. And very often you want to tap into someone's ego because people like to be stroked. Yep. So you know, you if, if you can hit someone's ego, tell them what's in it for both of you and make it super short and, and give them a reason why they should you know spend five or 10 minutes with you and not 30 minutes, but cap it, um, you have a much better chance than writing the Magna Carta and sending it to somebody. <laughs> But this is going to sound crazy. We were good at that. 
Yeah. We were really good at get if I got on the phone with you, very quickly articulating the ask and what it was and why it was important that we should meet, or what's the commonality if there was a common thread. Yep. Um, do you, you know, know what that pitch yeah. was? To, once you got Rich on the phone, do you remember the what's in it for me? Here's how we both benefit. Do you remember that? Well, I mean, ultimately, it's like we have the ability to bring, a, a, you know, an amazingly young, their average customer, the age of their customer was a lot older and it was yeah. corporate. So our, our storyline to them was we can in, introduce a generation of younger athletes and entertainers and Wall Street guys that will fly with you when they're 25 until they're 80. Yeah. So, you know, you can have the lifetime value of a customer is going to be meaningful. And we, we have the buy side. That's we have all the guys. We have the buy side. So, you know, love to sit with you for five minutes and, and, and share our vision of how we can bring this next generation of customer into your fleet at an early age. They'll be loyal forever and we can deliver that. So, um, okay. Yeah. Sounds shit. Sounds like it's a win win. Let's, let's talk, right? That, yeah. Great pitch. I mean, it, was, it was 30 years ago, so I don't remember the right. whole, it's, but you know, and it wasn't like off. That was that's off the top of my head. It was thought out at the yeah, time. Of course. If I ever get, you know, if I ever get to meet, first of all, I was we were obsessed with getting this deal. Like I said, we baked it into our DNA. Yeah. We already had the jet company in our head. We already had a billion dollars in sales. We already had four thousand members. We just didn't have any airplanes. Right. So now we had to go figure out how to get the airplanes. And awesome. and and yeah. Once we got the deal, we knew that the average the average price of time people were paying after year one was two hundred fifty thousand dollars. So we just said to ourselves, "Okay, all we need is four thousand customers. Yeah. If we get four thousand customers, we're doing a billion dollars a year." Then, then it was like, "All right, how do we get four thousand customers? Let's hire more, as many salesmen as we need to get to four thousand. But it's, the process has been the same." I'm gonna run 100 miles. I've already ran it in my head. I've done the race in my head. Now, how do I train for it? How do I get there? But like the end of the movie, it's already written. Yep. The final scene in the movie, it's in my head. It's done. I just gotta go backwards. I gotta back into it now. Okay, I got 90 days. I got 90 days to run 100 miles, which actually happened to me. How do I get there? You know, I'm gonna get there. But n now what? I I'm already, I'm already did the race. Now I just got to reverse engineer it into, the, into doing it again. Yeah. You know? You brought up, it's funny, you said, uh, you said two things, but one of them basically you had athletes and stockbrokers, and then you mentioned the buy side. It's funny you say that because I just finished the buy side by your friend Turney, which – Great book. Great book, man. What a charismatic dude. I mean, holy hell, what a life, huh? Yeah. Yeah. That guy. Yeah. Turney's an interesting story. You know, he started out on Wall Street making very, very little money, maybe twenty five, thirty thousand dollars a year at Morgan Stanley, and he quickly realized that the gal to his to his right went to Harvard, the gal to his left went to Duke, and there was no way he could add any value <laughs> to Morgan Stanley. But the only place in the office, the only place he could add value was at happy hour. Yep. And he became the king of happy hour and took that all the way up and wrote it to all these connections and information and became Uber, you know, became made multi, multi millions of dollars on Wall Street yep. until, until all that cocaine and everything he did at happy hour caught up to him. Yep. And it's a great story. It is. It is. It is. It'd be great to hear from him because that book is so dynamic and uh, it's fun. you're in the book, right? He, he references you several times throughout the book and how you were going to be the DJ and the music for, uh, I think he was going into Galliant, right? And you were, Galliant, yeah, yeah you, you helped him write a rap about it. I was like, oh, my man Jesse's in the book. I love it. That's funny. That's a great book. Anyways, a little promo for the book. The Buy Side's an awesome book. If you're an entrepreneur, if you're a hustler, if you're someone who just Wants a good book, right? Just to read a good book. The buy side, Turney Duff, he's an awesome dude. Um, charismatic, but I wanted to put that plug out there because that was a great book. Let's go into, um, again, you've had so many great endeavors, right? Zico Water, how did, 
you know, that I know your backstory, that actually came from your whole running side. And I know you've been running now for 25, 30 years or whatever it may be. Um, tell me a little bit about that, how that came about. Well, um, I am a runner. I started out running. Uh, my goal was two miles. I think we talked about this at the at the retreat, but yeah, or at this. But I started out with the goal of running two miles in twenty minutes, and I'm like eighteen minutes. I'm sorry, and I'm like if I could run at a nine minute pace for two miles, eighteen minutes, I'm a runner. Right. And I bet everybody listening, gun to head, could probably run two miles if they had to. And once I hit that goal. You know, nothing has changed in my body since then. I'm the same legs that I have, same. I'm not super strong, as you can see, nothing. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, my body's exactly the same body that God gave me. But I was able to run 100 miles from, with the same body. And the only thing that changed was the way I per- perceived what my limitations were. Yeah. Once I got past that two miles and I'm like, oh, man, I could do two. Can I do four? I took the same body, the two mile body, and I turned it into the hundred mile mind. And um, during the course of training for my hundred mile run, I did a lot of research on hydration and nutrition. Like, well, what if you're going to run for 24 straight hours? It took me 22 and a half hours nonstop. What do you eat and what do you drink? How many calories do you have to take in an hour so you don't crash? How much liquid do you have to drink per hour? How many ounces so you don't, you know, dehydrate? Right. And I did a lot of research. Did a lot of hydration on it. And the first thing I did is, at the time I did the run, there were only about four or five hundred, four hundred or so Americans that had done a hundred mile run. So there wasn't. This is two thousand and six. There was not a lot of information on ultra marathons. So I literally tracked down any article, person, movie, anyone I could speak to that had done a hundred miles successfully, and I asked them about it. What'd you do with your blisters? What did you eat? I just, I just, it became an obsession. Yeah. And. I felt like I was an authority on the topic before I even laced up my sneakers, and which is so important to business too. Yeah, becoming the expert, you know, and having the confidence of knowing and feeling like you belong is so important. So once I knew as much as I could about the race, I am, you know, I I discovered coconut water because all of the a lot of the research that I was doing was pointing to electrolytes and the best source of electrolytes being coconut water. So I became the human guinea pig for coconut water. Uh, I used it when I, as a recovery, I used it when I ran. And after the race, uh, which I which I said I finished and I didn't cramp, I, you know, I felt, it put me in a wheelchair for four days, but I, I would say that I felt, I did feel good during the race, um, aside from the blisters and the pain of, of the run. I'm like, man, this is the fountain of youth. You know, when people discover what I just discovered, this is going to be the next pomegranate or orange juice or cranberry juice. It's like it's going to be a category. So that's that was my introduction to coconut water. I spent a year traveling to Brazil, Jamaica, all over the country and world looking on at opportunities to import it. And I realized that that was not my strength. I'm not an operator. I'm a marketer. Yeah. And I, I partnered up with a company called Zico that was – doing about $3 million in sales at the time, very small, uh, and brought in Coca-Cola as a partner. So it was my group, the 100 Mile Group, Zico founding team, and Coca-Cola. And then two years later, Coke bought the whole thing. Isn't that great? I mean, I love it. And it goes back to what we started this kind of conversation about. You went out there and you just created the opportunity. You didn't wait for it. You didn't sit back and say, wow, this would be a great idea. You know, you went out there and you dug in, you became the expert and you said, listen, I know a couple people, it may not work out. Let me see if Coke and Zico and let's try to put this together. Cause at the end of the day, why not? Right? What do you have to really lose? It doesn't work out. Shit. Oh, well on to the next thing or maybe different introduction, but over and over since we've been talking now for about 45 minutes, your strength really comes into this. Who really gives a fuck mindset? Who's really judging me at the end of the day, we're all going to die and no one's going to think twice about me, right? And so it's it's really power. I mean, and also to you, know, you, but right now that's really a huge thing and a huge takeaway about why not go after what you want. You want to put that business together, you want to be in that business, go for it. Who cares if you fail? Do it again. Get up and do it again. 
right? Yeah, and I'm very, I'm very aware of the clock ticking. Yeah. And, and I'm in the second chapter of my life, you know, uh, or maybe, who knows, maybe it's the third, you just you never know, right? But I'm approaching 50, I'm 49, so I'm basically going to turn 50. And the years of, the years to be both relevant and I'm not going to go run 100 miles probably when I'm 80. Yeah. So what's my win- what's my window to accomplish stuff? Every day it shrinks. So once you realize that, once you really realize that, not just reading quotes and like, oh, okay, that, that's cool, I get it. Once that is embedded in you, then you don't. There's a ver- there's a sense of urgency in everything. Yep. And that's that's almost to my detriment because a lot of times I won't even plan or write a business plan. I'll just be like, good idea. Let's start it tomorrow. Like hiking the mountain. Incorporate that. You know, I'll call my lawyer. I'm like, trademark this, incorporate yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, we're in business. And they'll be like, well, what's the business? And I'm like, I don't the business, know. I don't know, but I know we have to do it now. <laughs> Dude, you and I are so similar with this whole thing. I will just, I'm ready, fire, aim. Great idea. Let's go do this. Let's start an LLC. We got to get it up. And what are we going to do? I have no fucking clue, but we're doing it. I'm all over this shit, right? I mean, that's who yeah. I am in my core, right? My business, it drives my business partners crazy because I just take action. I'm fearless because I, in the soul, I don't care, right? Like if I fail at this, oh well, right? But if I win and I succeed and I reach my goal, hell yeah, right? So I just create yeah. LLCs, I create models, I create strategies. Um, I just take action and, you know, we relate a lot on that. By the way, happy birthday, dude. Happy birthday. You. Finally, you're 49. You. I mean, for God's sakes, you can finally have fun. It's been a great 49 years of childhood. Yeah, right. So let's dive in. I know you're, you know, you've given us a lot of time. I want to get into something huge. Obviously, your book, Living with the Seal, is so dynamic. I think it was, it's a huge hit across the world. Obviously, a bestseller. Um, without giving everyone the details of the book, because you have to go by Living with the Seal, it is unbelievable, right? There's so many different lessons in that book that you can relate personally to business, uh, to relationships, all of it. But talk a little bit about what you learned from that experience. What was maybe the one or two biggest takeaways from that experience uh, with the SEAL? Uh, not writing the book necessarily, but with the SEAL that you, after that month, you were able to say, here's one or two or three things that those were my takeaways that will never that I've changed. I've actually yeah. changed now because of it. Well, I thought I was operating at a really high level before he came in. And I won't share the backstory of how I met him. It's, it's very interesting and, and why I hired him. Yeah. But I, I hired him because I wanted to see what makes a guy like this tick. And, uh, but I will say that I thought I was operating at a high level. And you know, I sold Marquee Jet and ran 100 miles, whatever, blah, blah, blah. But I felt um, – but I realized that I, had, I was really under-indexing for what I was capable of. And I had so much more. So he had a rule called the 40% rule that anytime you think when your brain tells you you're done, you still have 40% more in you. And I realized that I was not uh, tapping into as much as I could. Yeah. And, and you know, so I've learned to go past the threshold of pain and discomfort, not physical necessarily. It could be humiliation. It could be frustration at work. It could be a roadblock and just power through that. And realized that like I have more, so that was that was a big a big lesson. Uh, yeah, that I took away. That's I mean, that's, I, I, I'm very aware of that when I'm when I'm doing stuff, and I'm like, wow, I got more, I got more. And just the physical aspect, I can relate to it because I like to, you know, we talked about how I'm big into CrossFit, and no, I'm not one of those ah CrossFit, blah. no, but I like the competitiveness, I like the team camaraderie part of it, but part of that is a mental game. I mean that type of working out uh, is more mental than anything because throughout your workouts, we had a 25-minute workout yesterday, and by minute 16, mentally, can this just be over? I'm dying. I'm on the verge of vomiting right now, and I want to give up. Well, I just set up a really cool challenge. Uh, It's called called 29029, 29zero29.com, but basically, it's it's up your alley. You should come. We rented Stratton Mountain, the whole mountain in Vermont. Okay. 
Okay. And we're bringing in bands and food trucks and all this, and, and you sleep in a teepee, all this stuff. But the challenge is you go up the mountain, take the run, walk, crawl, hike, whatever you want. Take the gondola down, up, down, up, down until you climb Everest. So it's 29,000, 29 feet, and you have two and a half days to do it. So to your point, those kind of challenges to me really translate into all the areas of your life. A, you learn about yourself. What are you made of? How much more do you have in you? B, you fight through you know, boredom, pain. You have, to make a, you have a game plan. You have to rip it up. All, it's just show, it's just parallels life so much. So we're doing that in October, and uh, I'm really excited about that. We took literally took the, the world's hardest climb, Mount Everest, yeah. and, which is unrealistic to get to with all the altitude, cost, travel, totally. et cetera. And we brought it to the States, man. When's this? I might, I might hit you up and just show up. October 15th in uh, Stratton, Vermont. And you can check it out at 29, the number 290, dot 29com It's cool. Awesome. Well, and yeah. then, so you're doing that. And then I was just talking to Sean yesterday. You're also coming back for the Extreme Freedom event. You're speaking at the Extreme Freedom event. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. That's awesome. You're such a go. You're a busy dude, man. So you will be speaking at the Extreme Freedom event. So for all you listeners who are going, you're going to hear even more from Jesse. But um, the last thing I wanted you to share that was so impactful for me was that you talk about the guy on your shoulder, right, who says you can't do it, and then the guy who says you can. Jump very briefly into that before we kind of wrap it up. And you have some great events coming up. And uh, your book and you have some great charities that you know Kent and Sean and myself have donated to that I really want to promote towards the end of this but before we get there um, explain a little bit more about that mindset right you called it the hundred mile mind which is a great term for it about that I don't care I'm gonna overlook that fear go into something like that well I invest a lot of time and thought into that mentality and it's like I said, it's the little things. I'm just very aware of the voice. The vo- you know, there's a million reasons to stop. It running sucks. Working can suck. And um, you want to be with your kids. You want to be at the pool. You want to do all that stuff. Um, but I just, I just pride myself on trying to be a finisher. Yeah. And yeah. trying to give it my effort. And um, every day. So every day I do something hard. Every day I do something hard. Uh, and I, when I mean hard, I mean like if I'm going to work out, I'm, I'm there for a reason. If I'm going to spend the time, I'm going 120%. And my 120% might be 80% of what you can do. You, yeah. you know, I mean, you might kill me. Right. And I'm not comparing myself to anybody other than my effort. And it's in everything. It's in everything. At least I try to. And there's days where I struggle with that. But in general, um, because – that grit, that resilience translates. So for me, it starts in the morning with a workout and then that carries over. It even starts, it starts with a workout, translates into a shower. I take cold showers. Yeah. So I'll jack it up to freezing, stay in as long as I can and then count 10 Mississippis. But then after a workout and a cold shower and I've already planned my day in advance, who, I feel like I'm at an advantage. Like who wants to go against me? <laughs> Not to sound like an ass, but I'm like yeah. I've already I've already inflicted a cold shower on me. I've already ran to the point where like you know you're exercising on a treadmill in a gym with fans. It's 103 degrees outside, and I'm you know I'm cooked. That makes me feel good, and that I like my chances. Yeah, I like my chances going into life with that. Yeah, and let's talk about that. I mean, you have this whole uh, we do hard stuff, right? You're wearing the hat. Um, it's a Facebook group. I mean, it's everything. Talk a little bit about the We Do Hard stuff, what it's about, what it's, yeah. you know. I set up, I set up uh, and I'm seeing that I have 2%. So if I, if I end up, we, we've out-talked Apple. <laughs> uh, if, yeah, I set up this group, hashtag We Do Hard Stuff on Facebook. Every month I pose a challenge, a yeah. different challenge for the month, physical. And if anyone, can, anyone that completes it, I donate $100 to the charity that we're supporting that much. Each, each month is a different charity. So to date, we've had eight different charities from Special Operations Warrior Foundation to Cerebral Palsy Special Olympics to um, Parkinson's, et cetera, uh, triple negative breast cancer. Every month it changes. And we've donated or raised well over a quarter of a million dollars already. And we've, I think we have like, we've 
10, like 10,000 people every month participating in these challenges. So there's no gym needed. Um, anyone can do it on any level. And it's building awareness, getting you in shape, and raising money. I call it fitlanthropy. Yeah. Fitness and philanthropy. Uh, and it's been great. It's yeah. been great. And I know Sean Kent and I donated to uh, Pencils. Pencil. Yeah, it was super cool, you guys. We built a school with Pencils of Promise. Of promise and you guys right? were very, very, very generous of you guys. Oh, dude. Just – I'm concerned that this 1% is going to tick off. So if it does, I, um, I'm not rushing off at all. Ticked off. 